November 4th, 1944. You know you can take the capital city. You know it. You just need five days, that's all, to regroup. And then it's yours, easy peasy, and without even too many dead bodies. But now word comes down. You don't have five days. You must do it right now, immediately. What happens then? You fail. You are Rodion Malinovsky. I'm Indy Nidell. This is World War II. Last week saw the massive Battle of Leyte Gulf, which shattered the Japanese Navy. However, although it may no longer be much of a fighting force, the age of the kamikaze began, and they can still do an awful lot of damage. American landings on Leyte Island progressed, the Slovak national uprising was on the ropes, and the Germans surprised the Allies in the Peel Marshes of the Netherlands. The Germans renew their attacks in the Peel Marshes on the 29th, driving back the Allies and capturing Liesel. These attacks last week and this are supposed to have been just big raids to convince the Allies to call off their attacks against the 15th Army in trouble north and west of Antwerp, or divert force from there. But German commander Walter Model thinks this could be a bigger thing, so he asks Gerd von Rundstedt at OB West for reinforcements. However, not only are there not any of them readily available, Rundstedt thinks the gains made have not been enough to justify getting them. And they haven't done anything anyhow to slow attacks on the 15th Army, so he calls it to a halt. They have, though, in fact, succeeded in getting a division diverted away from fighting the 15th, but they don't know it. Modal does get permission for another day of attacks to gain a better line, which causes British commander Bernard Montgomery to divert another division and some artillery, but the front here stabilizes by the 30th. By the 1st, with Allied landings on Valkaren Island heralding a likely end to that sector of the fighting, Montgomery decides to put all of 12th Corps to the right of 7th Armored Division along the Nederwirt Vesem Canal for a drive towards Venlo. 7th Armored will attack aiming generally towards Mejel. As for near Antwerp itself, on the 30th, the Canadians fight their way across South Beveland and reach Valkaren Canal. Now, German 70th Division Commander Wilhelm Dosser has moved his men to Valkyren Island for a last-ditch defense, and it is the toughest obstacle to overcome to free the port of Antwerp for Allied use. On the 1st, the battle for Valkyren begins. A brigade from British 52nd Division and three commando groups make landings, backed by battleship Warspite and smaller ships near Flushing. Flushing falls the 2nd, as does North Bevelin. On the 3rd, the fighting on Valkaren is intense, but the various Allied bridgeheads are managing to link up. And today, the first Allied minesweepers make it from the sea to Antwerp. The fighting northeast of Antwerp continues as well, with elements of the US 415th Infantry Regiment crossing the mark near Breda the 31st. The fighting over the next few days is heavy, with the Germans pushing the attackers back over the river. But by midday the 3rd, the Germans no longer have a cohesive front line along the mark, and they are in fact withdrawing their artillery to Mordike. The British and Poles on the American flanks have also advanced, so it seems that soon enough, the campaign to clear the enemy from south of the Moss will be over. But you know, after all the huge Allied gains in the West in August and early September, we've seen the pace of advance slow dramatically. A big part of this is logistics, since until they can clear the port of Antwerp for use, they still have to transport most of their stuff all the way from Normandy. But there's also the undeniable fact, as John Keegan goes into detail about in his The Second World War, of the improved fighting strength of the German army. That might seem a bit of a surprise for you, but in just September and the first half of October, the Home Army has managed to raise 150,000 men and OB West a further 90,000. Okay, the Germans did lose 150,000 men during this time, but there's also this. Despite the full resumption of the Anglo-American point-blank bombing offensive after Normandy, German industry had achieved higher levels of output of war material in September than in any month of the war, thanks to the success of Speer's policy of dispersal of production and assembly away from the traditional centers. As a result, tank and assault gun production during 1944 approached that of the Soviet Union during the same period. 
the 11,000 medium tank and assault guns, 16,000 tank destroyers, and 5,200 heavy tanks produced were sufficient to keep existing panzer divisions in the field and to provide the material for 13 new panzer brigades. Okay, sure, but Keegan follows that up with this piece of brilliance. Much self-delusion was necessary at Hitler's headquarters to represent this rebuilding and re-equipment as genuine reparation for the losses suffered in the catastrophic summer of 1944. Hitler, however, was a master of self-delusion and also of clutching at straws. See, all this time, Hitler has been planning a major counteroffensive in the West to go off in late November, claiming that with night, fog, and snow grounding the Allied air power, they would win easily. On September 16th, he announced this to his operations staff, and the plan was to attack out of the Ardennes and take Antwerp, right? He figures the Allies really need Antwerp for any offensive into Germany, and taking it would set that back by months. This would also cut off the British 2nd and Canadian 1st armies from the Allied forces to the south, and they could be surrounded and destroyed, thus reversing the balance of power in the west. This is something of a fantasy, but it's bolstered in his mind by the fact that the Allies have left the Ardennes to be a secondary front, just as they did in 1940, and which the Germans sure as hell exploited then. As for Hitler's top commanders in the West, Rundstedt and Model agree in late October that the plan does not have a leg to stand on. So they come up with a smaller plan to not destroy the enemy across the Ardennes, but just really hurt him. This week on the 3rd, Hitler sends Operations Chief Alfred Jodl to see Model to tell him the big plan is unalterable. With the exception, that the start date is pushed back and will begin in December. He does take Model's name for the smaller operation to use for the bigger one, though. Autumn Mist. I will talk more about this in coming weeks, obviously. Whether or not that plan works out, the 40,000-plus fresh German troops that Heinrich Himmler sent into Slovakia to destroy the Slovak national uprising have sure succeeded in their plan. So, by midweek, Soviet officers have broken the first Czechoslovak army up into small guerrilla units that will hopefully be able to carry on fighting the Germans in the mountains. Well, this is supposedly on Rudolf Viest's final order to the army, but it can't even be given to most of the army because of communications issues. There's a bunch of issues between the communist and non-communist elements by now. The communists, especially those Soviet partisans here, claim that a lot of the Slovaks want to use the 1st Czechoslovak Army and the 1st Czechoslovak Corps from the USSR to form a new bourgeois army. The countercharges include trying to foment a rift between the army and the Slovak partisans. Czechoslovak ambassador to the USSR Zdeněk Fierlinger has said that there should have been an experienced Red Army general coordinating all involved parties. Jan Masaryk, government in exile foreign minister, says no, the Soviet-Czechoslovak agreement from May says that even if they're operationally under the Soviets, those military units raised in the USSR should have a Czechoslovak commander. And that same agreement mentions nothing at all about the Slovak forces. But efforts to bring the First Corps into the First Army under Viest have also caused a fair amount of strain. Viest, who came from London in early October, to run the Slovak uprising, and Jan Golian, who commands the 1st Czechoslovak Army, are both captured November 3rd. So they are in German hands now, and the uprising has been crushed. It is true, too, that for all the political deviousness they had been behind during the uprising, the Red Army paid a lot. Kirill Moskalenko, trying to fight his way through to the Slovaks, lost, as I said recently, 80,000 men and the 1st Czechoslovak Corps took over 6,500 men killed, and that's nearly half of its original strength. As for Soviet plans and attacks, on the 28th, Stavko orders Rodion Malinovsky's 2nd Ukrainian Front to strike towards Budapest, just a frontal attack, and take it using only relatively small force. Ivan Petrov's 4th Ukrainian Front will tie down 1st Panzer Army in Czechoslovakia with a deep drive, preventing them from diverting any force towards Budapest. 
Fyodor Tolbukin's third Ukrainian front is to regroup on the left and drive into Hungarian territory on the flank. And so Malinovsky works out the basics of his plan. However, Stalin sabotages all of this before it can even get going with a phone call to Malinovsky, part of which I will recite for you now with my friend Spartacus Olsen, which I got from John Erickson's The Road to Berlin. It is absolutely essential that in the shortest possible time, in days even, you capture the capital of Hungary, Budapest. This has to be done no matter what it costs you. Can you do this? This assignment could be carried out within five days, once 4th Guard's mechanized corps moves up to 46th Army. This movement is expected to be complete by November 1st. Then 46th Army, reinforced by two Guard's mechanized corps, 2nd and 4th, would be able to mount a powerful attack, which would come as a complete surprise to the enemy and in two to three days, take Budapest. The Stavka cannot give you five days. You understand that it is because of political considerations that we have to go to Budapest as quickly as possible. I very definitely understand we have to take Budapest in view of these political considerations. However, we should wait for the arrival of Fourth Guard's mechanized corps. Only under these considerations will it be possible to count on success. We cannot consider postponing the offensive for five days. It is necessary to go over to the offensive for Budapest at once. If you give me, as of now, five days, five days as an absolute maximum, Budapest will be taken. If we go over to the offensive without delay, then 46th Army, for sheer lack of force, will not be able to develop its blow quickly. It will inevitably get bogged down in heavy fighting at the very approaches to the Hungarian capital. Putting it briefly, it cannot seize Budapest off the march. You are arguing all to no purpose. You do not understand the political necessity of mounting an immediate attack on Budapest. I understand all the political importance of taking Budapest. And for that very reason, I am asking five days. I categorically order you to go over to the offensive for Budapest tomorrow. Okay. Snooki am siya po siya, Yosia. Snoochayu tibia pierwim rodia. So Malinovsky issues orders for 46th Army to attack the morning of October 29th. This they do and by the morning of the 30th have driven 30 kilometers into the German positions. Seventh Guards make a bridgehead over the Tissa, and things look like they're going great guns. However, the regrouping is, of course, uncompleted. But Second and Fourth Guards mechanized as the spearheads smash their way ahead all week, despite heavy enemy counterattacks. And by today, the lead tanks have reached the eastern and southern Budapest suburbs. However, the bulk of the infantry isn't anything like close to catching up with them. And in fact, four panzer divisions, among other big units, have moved to positions in front of 46th Army's advance. And the right flank of the entire thrust is also vulnerable to enemy attack from the north. Today on that flank, Zolnok falls to 7th Guard's army, who then advance on Sigled, 60 kilometers from Budapest, but north of them is all Germans. Germans with tanks and tank battles develop north of the Budapest Highway, and the Germans hold their ground. So today, Stavka says to Malinovsky, an attack on Budapest along a narrow front with only two mechanized corps, together with an insignificant body of infantry, can lead to unjustified losses, and expose the troops operating along this axis to the danger of an enemy blow against their flanks from the northeast. I am pretty sure that Malinovsky knew all of that during the phone call with Stalin, though. And any chance to quickly take Budapest, which Malinovsky thinks he could have done if he'd been given those five days, is gone. Stavka wants to next try bringing round the right flank armies and attack the city from the north and northeast, while 46 hits it from the south. But they're not going to be in position to do this till at least the end of next week. But as this week ends, the fight in the suburbs of Budapest is not just bloody, but causes panic in the city. Early in the week to the south, the Soviets and Bulgarians fight hard to take Kraljevo and Skopje in Yugoslavia. If you will recall, Kraljevo is vital to the Germans to keep the route open for their evacuation from Greece and Macedonia. 
But by now, Alexander Lur has evacuated enough force that his units are up to the challenge, stopping the Soviets at Kraljevo II and the Bulgarians at Skopje by today. Lur's Army Group E is thus spared a winter march through the coastal mountains, which would mean almost certain death. And on the 31st, other units of his evacuate Salonika, which the British enter the first. Any Axis forces still in the islands now have nowhere to evacuate to. The German withdrawal from Finland also continues. The 169th Infantry Division abandons the Schutzwald position south of Ivalo, beginning the 31st and finishing by today. The 2nd Mountain Division hits Reichstrasse 50, the Arctic Highway, the 2nd, and already October 29th, 18th Mountain Corps starts falling back from the Sturmbach position, west of Karasuwando. 7th Mountain Division is going to remain there as flank protection for other units. But the Allies are having real problems down in Italy. At the end of October 1944, British 8th Army faced the strain of prolonged battle. It had a shortage of infantry, whose morale was affected by issues such as the rationing of provisions and ammunition. Also, on the 2nd of November, British 1st Division was withdrawn. By now, the weather had started to become more wintry. So, British 5th Corps commander Charles Cately, at a conference on the 29th, comes up with a plan to take only close objectives. 8th Army should reach positions that will allow it to attack Ravenna from the west, jumping off from the Via Emilia, or State Road 9 these days, since an attack up the coast would be in seriously marshy terrain, so that's out. British 4th and Indian 10th Divisions are to attack north of Cesena. British 46 along the Via Emilia and the Polish 2nd Corps to the west to head north and attack Forli. The attacks go off from the 30th, but stiff resistance and heavy rains over the rest of the week spoil them, and Kitely rethinks and regroups for new attacks. There are changes in both Italian commands. Smiling Albert Kesselring's car collided with a towed gun last week, putting him in hospital with head injuries, so he's out for the time being, replaced by Heinrich von Fietinghoff. Richard McCreary takes over British 8th Army this week on the 3rd, and there are also some new deployments in the American sector. From November 1st, the Brazilian 1st Division is fully deployed in U.S. 4th Corps area, and from next week on the 8th, the U.S. 92nd Buffalo Division will be too. The Brazilians on the left wing of 2nd Corps, and the Buffalo Division on the coast at the left of 4th Corps area. That Corps also has the South African 6th Division under it today from the 4th. That Corps also has an 80 kilometer front and a lot of untested units, so at the moment, operations are by necessity limited. American operations in the Philippines are also having issues this week. Okay, on the 2nd, the Americans take Karagara, right? General Kruger had now completed the second phase of his operation. Panaon and San Juanico Straits had been secured, 6th Army had reached the west coast of the island, and the entire force was in place for a drive on the Ormok Valley, which was believed to be the last Japanese stronghold. Things were looking good for U.S. 6th Army, but in fact, the Japanese were just beginning their battle for Leyte. See, Japanese planes from all over the Philippines are being flown into Leyte to give real punch, and this has a pretty immediate effect. The bombing and strafing attacks were successful in stalling the American advance. For the first time since the early days of the Papuan campaign, MacArthur found himself fighting without the benefit of close air support for his ground forces. Typhoon storms had interrupted the long-range patrols being flown at extreme range from the 5th Air Force advance base at Morotai. Army engineers found that even with tons of steel matting, laying out airstrips on Leyte's swampy east coast was like metal laid on a jello mold. The Marines had only 150 planes operational at the end of the first week, and attrition rates soared alarmingly because of the heavy enemy bombing and the poor landing strips. MacArthur was to be constantly reminded by daily raids that singled out his field headquarters that Japan controlled the air over the island. And 6th Army Commander Walter Kruger knows that Japanese reinforcements are arriving. And the main reason for the Americans to even hit Leyte was to establish airfields and logistical bases. And that's just barely happening, with only the Takloban airfield even operational, though not complete, this week. 
It had to be enlarged for American planes. It is also surrounded by a swamp. But taking Karagara is important. It's a junction town on the road to the East Coast and also west along Karagara Bay. Then it goes around the mountains and to the Ormoc Corridor. If Kruger could take the corridor and Ormoc, he would effectively control the island. But from the first, the Japanese first division, an elite formation, arrives at Ormoc and heads north to join the rest of the Japanese. And their strength has suddenly gone from 20,000 to nearly 34,000. They plan to push 6th Army back east into the sea. And though there is fighting already today and yesterday, I will talk about it next week. The Japanese are gaining ground in China this week. Despite all the rains and logistical issues, and the 120,000 Chinese fighting delaying actions, the Japanese finally managed to reach the general areas of both Guilin and Liu Xiao this week on the 1st. Chinese Nationalist General Bai Shongxi goes to Chongqing the 30th to try and get help for the whole Guangxi province battle. He tells Chiang Kai-shek's staff that it's really pointless to try to defend Guilin without really defending Liu Xiao. A remarkable turnabout since, as we saw, he said he could hold Guilin for two months not that long ago. But the fall of Liu Xiao would expose Guilin to attacks from both south and north. So what he's done is move his best divisions to Liu Xiao. He meets Chang himself the next day and asks for reinforcements. Chang says it's too late to send more troops to Guilin, and this was not Bai's plan. He also says to forget Liu Xiao and focus on Guilin. Bai is unable to talk him out of this. And there I will end this week of the war. Everyone seems to have issues with their plans not working out. On Leyte, in Guangxi, in Italy, in Hungary. Although things look promising for the Allies up near Antwerp. And Hitler's coming offensive in the West postponed to December. Coming out of the Ardennes too, right? Wow. Sure is bold. Of course, top dogs Walter Model and Gerd von Rundstedt don't think much of it. And Model's always positive they're going to succeed. As for other people's thoughts on the matter, well, there are two panzer armies to be involved in performing this operation, the 5th and 6th, commanded by Hasso von Manteuffel and Sepp Dietrich. Dietrich has this to say, All Hitler wants me to do is cross a river, capture Brussels, and then go and take Antwerp. And all this, in the worst time of the year, through the Ardennes, when the snow is waist deep, and there isn't room to deploy four tanks abreast, let alone armored divisions, when it doesn't get light until eight, and it's dark again at four, and with reformed divisions made up chiefly of kids and sick old men. And at Christmas. That's the plan. And my plan is to cover that offensive, however it turns out, and all the other offensives until this war is over. I can do that thanks to the efforts of the Time Ghost Army. You too can join the army at timeghost.tv or patreon.com. These are the newest commissioned army officers, and John Shapiro is the army member of the week. And hey, plans can get out of hand, and plans can get confusing. So for a look back at how Chiang Kai-shek ended up on top in the first place, check out this Between Two Wars episode from 1926. And do not forget to subscribe. See you next time.